So, ride your wave. All right, so we got another one. It seems like these days we just keep watching a lot of things from the same people. Right? Well, because uh, Yuasa is cranking out way too much content. Right, okay. So here's the thing, right? So if you look at the top anime directors, right? You got your Miyazaki Ghibli. Yep. You got your Hosoda. You had the you got Satoshi Kon. right? Hosoda's putting out one every three years. Miyazaki and Ghibli are putting out one every century. Yep. Right? <laughs> uh, how often, it, you know, but the point is, Masaki Yuasa and Sain Saru are cranking out not just TV shows, but also movies at a shocking rate. Uh, so this movie came out in Japan months ago, uh, but finally made its way to the U.S. One night only in U.S. theaters, some subtitles, thanks to G-Kids, of course. Yep. Uh, and I said, well, I guess I have to go see that. Yep. So even though we, it feels like we just talked about Walk On Girl. And also, we not that long ago uh, reviewed another movie that has very, 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 very similar Oh, themes. yeah, Lou Over the Wall, right? So Lou Over the Lou Wall, over the, which right. was also Yuasa. Right, and had the same producer as this, right? So there's there was Lou Over the Wall, Walk on Girl, and this. Bang, bang, bang. It's like, they're just... Cr- it feels like those movies are coming way too fast from from the studio. Yep, and uh, just to remind you, before this, because I, I want to go through some of these. Ping Pong the Animation, 2014. Adventure Time, that oh, yeah, one episode that of Food yet. Chain, 2014. Space Dandy, 2014. And then A Gap, because that's when they founded Science Saru. And then Night of Short Walk-On Girl, 2017. Lure Over the Wall, also 2017. Devil Man Cry Birch, baby, 2018. Well, they only, I think they only did one episode of uh, Der- Space Dandy, right? Uh, director, writer, animation supervisor, and storyboard for the episode Slow and Steady right. Wins it the was Race, sort of like, It was like Adventure Time, where there was one episode that yep. was totally insane that was by them. But, you know, Yuasa did, like, one crazy episode. Anyway. So, this movie, uh, just the short version is, it is absolutely worth seeing. It is a fantastic mm-hmm. movie. It is extremely well executed, and I have very few complaints about it. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing... At the same time, uh, while that is all true... It's also not like, oh my God, it's the best movie ever. It's a legendary, right? Yeah. It's like, it's like, it's it's between good and great, right? But I guess maybe maybe it is great, but not legendary great. But what I would say is like that- Like regular great? For what it is, because the story it told was a relatively straightforward story. Like there oh, are yeah. no surprises right. in Right, so movie. I read the synopsis, right? And this is not spoiler, right, for the movie at all, because all this stuff happened super early in the movie. And right? also, you can figure this out from the tr- the teaser trailer. Right, so this is, a, the, the synopsis of the movie is, okay, uh, there's some, you know, 20-somethings that live in like a beach town, right? Uh, the girl's a pro surfer. The girl is like a, a basically a pro surfer. The dude is a fireman. They fall in love. The dude dies. And then it becomes a situation like that, you know, movie Ghost with Whoopi yep. Goldberg and those other people, right? Where the dude's a ghost with the pottery, but, right? I'm That's, not surprised that of all the headlining actors and actresses you might have said as Ghost, you know, the movie with, I was surprised you said Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> Yeah, because that's a, a a recognizable person. The other the There's main, a, the main two people were just generic Hollywood hot people. I don't remember their names, and I wouldn't recognize them on the street. You don't. But Whoopi Goldberg is a recognizable, unique individual. You don't remember who Patrick Swayze is? I know that's the name of a famous person, but if he walked into this room right now and said, "What is my name?" I would say, I "Have no fucking clue." If Patrick Swayze walked into this room right now, unless he looks radically different from old age or something, I would be like, "Wow, it's Patrick Swayze." I would say. You're an unusually hot person. Are you a Hollywood actor of some kind, maybe, or you know, famous person? But I don't know. Your, I don't know your name. And they say I'm Patrick Swayze. I'm like, I know that name. That is the name of a famous person. And then I'd say you were in things. What were you in? Ghost. Oh, I've seen that. Okay. But uh, to put out like a broader, and the whole movie is just her sort of processing his death, basically. Yes. With a little bit of magical realism that does not necessarily need to be real. It could just be in her head, though there's a fun little nod at the end to make it clear there's a little bit of magic going on. But the movie is exactly what I expected it to be, except the execution was so good that I actually want to bring it a lot of praise and point out a lot of very specific things I think it did well. Right. So um, usually the other Yuasa Sain Saru works, right, are usually sort of you know, plot-wise and character-wise, really out there and, and Like, and crazy. Night is Short, Walk On Girl, I defy you to summarize the events of that movie succinctly. Right, to Tommy Galaxy, which has the same characters, basically, is yep. also it's just completely, like, out there, kind of trippy and, and nutty, 
right? Devil Man Cry Baby, that shit is fucked up and insane, right? Yep. This is really plot wise and character wise much more in line with a a, a very you know, down to earth kind of anime. Yep. Right. More in line with a, a plot you would see from Hosoda. Though, right? but but what it really interested me is that there's actually a pretty good number of characters for how sort of zoomed in. Some the of them show. have almost no screen time. But the characters that get screen time are surprisingly nuanced characters. Oh yeah. And a lot of the things I thought, oh, I guess I guess that's gonna happen. That person will date that person. None of those things happened. <laughs> oh, everything I thought would happen happened. Uh, well, ex- the one thing I predicted very specifically was the sister and like her deal. Yeah, I, I-, I picked that one up pretty early, mm. and I was glad that the other fireman did not date a different character. Yeah, because that's a direction a, l- a more pedestrian version of this movie would have gone. Well, that's wool. Yeah, but the pro not the problem, but the interesting thing about this movie is that it's so soon after Lou over the wall. And both this and Lure Over the Wall... Lure Over the Wall, another completely crazy one. <laughs> but they both, in many ways, tell a very similar story, and they're both about using water as a metaphor for the threshold of death and right, transformation. The, the central plots of both movies, even though one's a children's movie and one is you know, a, a more adult... Yep. Not, not completely adult, but a more adult romance movie, maybe like a teenage romance movie, maybe? Call it right? Uh, is that they're both about people dying at sea. Yep. But right? Lou Over like the Wall... like central to the, you know... Lou Over the Wall was more about water and the mermaids were the metaphor for, uh, on one hand, the uh, ostensibly suicidal feelings of the main character, coupled with, like, the processing of death, coupled with the death of, like, ideas and culture and, like, the old way that town was and how things change as time goes on and mm-hmm. the past mm-hmm. dies eventually. This one is very literally... The death of one person yes. and the the reverberations, or dare I say, the waves that person made both uh, metaphorically and literally in the world and how that affected the people around them. And then, well, also about the people riding those waves, right? Yep, Which is and, why the name of the movie comes from. Yep, and it's, how not, ri- it's not really subtle with its message. Yep, right? but, it, it, it's, but it's the real, movie... It's not to the point where, you know, in, sometimes there are movies where... or or any kind of storytelling medium where, you know, their message is so sort of told so ham-fistedly and overtly that it's inelegant, right? Here, it is overt, right? To where they literally just spell it out for you. It's one of the rare movies that can get away with saying the name of the movie and it doesn't sound stupid. Right, it's like, it's like, you know, you need to ride your wave to do, right? But they do it in a way that doesn't feel, you know, sort of, you know, tacked on or or you know like uncomfortable yep. right like you know it feels like natural and it's just like oh it's just not it's you know it's like oh, okay you didn't really do this in a, in a tacky way you just did it in a way to where there's no way the audience can miss it yep but at the same time what i really appreciate about this movie is how much it trusted the audience to notice things and how a lot of the subtle things that happened in the movie were not spelled out and it assumed that you would well, notice anime, these little bits. Anime does that a lot in general. Yeah. But in particular, this one is at a one point there's a large time skip, right? And yeah. And then there are several... Re- you don't really know what happened in that time and it doesn't matter too much, but there are references or tiny flashbacks to things that... It's not a super long time skip, but it's long enough. There are tiny flashbacks to events that happened in the time skip or characters will reference things that happened in the time skip, but they didn't show you those things. So it's like, you know, it's like if I went to Rim and said, hey, remember the time something happened? And the time something happened was not in the movie yet. Yep. Right? It happened during a time in the movie that got ignored, but it's still okay. Right? It totally works. Yep. The other interesting thing is, uh, and it seems like this is a uh, science saru thing, they hyper-researched like the details of the things they were portraying to the point that like there is a lot of very detailed long running shots of firefighting techniques and firefighting equipment that is like accurate to a shocking degree. The surfing is also extremely accurate. The life-saving techniques, tiny little bits. Like, there's two different scenes where someone, like, takes an unconscious person and flips them onto a surfboard or a raft. Right. That's, like, that's a technique you learn in life-saving. Right. I think because, like I was saying, this one is much more grounded in the real world compared to their other works, right? Compared to, say, like, Lou Over the Wall, 
right? So therefore, even though I'm sure they researched things for those other mo- works as thoroughly, right? Say, for example, like there was like a bicycle episode of Tatami Galaxy. I'm yep. sure that they researched bicycles for that. But because this is much more grounded in the real world, the real world matching research shines through. It's like you can see that they put that work into it when you watch the movie mm-hmm. rather than whereas they might have done it for other things, but it's less visible and, and you know, obvious. I mean, it was weird for me because, like, I am a son of a fireman and I spent a lot of time around firefighting equipment as a kid. And part of my brain was like... That part's accurate. That's a Japanese only thing. That's the that's like this class of fire hydrant. Right, well, you know, when we class. talk about anime, we talk a lot about uh, at least in, on the Judge anime show, which will come back eventually. The guns. We talk about guns. It's like, hey, you're reading some manga, you're watching some anime, and that gun is just drawn in exquisite detail, right? It's like, well, the person who made this clearly likes guns, and it's clearly about the guns, right? Or yep. the guns could be anything, right? In initial D, the cars are the guns. Yep. Right. Well, in this, there are several guns in this movie, right? And I think the biggest one is coffee. Coffee is the biggest gun in this movie. They're basically constantly drawing the the process of making coffee. Uh, And firefighting is also a gun. Yep. But uh, the detail in the drawing... And surfing and making omurice. Yes. The detail in the drawings uh, and animation of people making coffee in cafes, on the beach, in their homes right, is not only a, so highly detailed and realistic, right, to sort of, you know, appeal to coffee fanboys who, you know, want to make coffee in a fancy way. You have all that CO2 but bloom. they're always doing it the exact same way every time they do it as like this, you know, repeated, you know, imagery to tie, you know, various scenes together. Because it, it, right? it, it, it's, it's subtle, but it ties together the like, the interest in the topic of how to make this kind of coffee having like spread from person to person in parallel to all the other ideas that spread like waves among these people affecting each other. Yep. Yeah. Cause the dude who died was way into coffee. Yep. Right. And then the everyone, he, he, after he's dead, you see more coffee making than when he was alive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but in terms of this, something that and you might clearly not- meta meta think right. Yep. It's people, there's clearly one or more people at the studio who are way into coffee and this coffee making process in particular. Well, that also is, from the they uh, definitely inserted it because this coffee fan people at the studio from the interview with the it could producer, have been anything. It could have been any you know. On Young Choi, the uh, producer, they, they they talked a lot about how much research. Science Saru did for this movie in particular mm-hmm. and how like they got surfing lessons and life-saving lessons. I wouldn't be surprised if they like shadowed a fire department in a beach town. I wouldn't town. be surprised if they went to ma- several cafes. Yep. Right? To to watch them make coffee. Uh and I guess like overall cuz like you just it's an anime movie. Like just watch it. I'm not going to explain the rest of the plot to you other than that it is deeply satisfying. It's extremely well animated. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Uh It'll hit you right in the feels. I cried a few times during it. I think the other thing is that, you know, like I was saying, it's not so as crazy, surreal, and unrealistic as the other works by Yuasa, but he still manages to put in the tra- his trademark art style, right, all mm. over it. Like, you can tell immediately who made it, yep. even though it's so different in many ways because of the, the way the characters move, the way the lines on the edge, you know, the characters don't like, you know, hold hold their same like solid shape. Yup, yup. Right? They're sort of stretchy a little bit and wiggly. He, you know, he always does a little bit of wiggliness and the lines on the edge of the characters are, it's almost like they're thicker and thinner at the same time because they're sort of, you know, they move a little mm. bit, right? They're not, you know. Characters all have like pretty unique or interesting walk cycles right. and like the way characters move is very tied to what they're about. Yeah, and then... You know, of course, the the this trademark thing of sort of moving the you know it's not a real camera, but the virtual camera perspective and also oh, when she's of, riding her bike, right? You know, he'll go he'll go low with wide angles or long crazy angle, right? Uh, all over the place the way he does in you know a more a less realistic anime, right? But he's still doing that in this you know story that is m- mostly just real normal world stuff, right? Yep, but there's enough crazy stuff uh, and magical stuff that, like, yeah, you couldn't make this live action. No, <laughs> even though it's like so, you can make like almost all of it live action, right? But then they just, you know, 
they make they go that extra mile. It's like, no, just kidding, you couldn't. Well, like the the ending scene of this movie, like the the climax of the movie, to make that without animation would be on a, <laughs> and that would impossible. Be a pra- it would be a practical effects effort on the level of like Back to the Future Two or like a Star Wars. Yeah, it would not be you know doable. That is one hell of a climax too. That was yeah. a good scene. Yeah. So kind of got a little, you know, stretches your uh, disbelief a little bit, but it's all right. I was <laughs> totally down with the stretch of belief in that final scene, just because I it, was like, "All right, I see what you're gonna do here. Fine." Yeah, it's like in the interview <laughs> when the producer was like, "I'll go." You with also it. explained what he wanted to happen at the end, and she was like, "What?" Yeah, it's like, what? "All right, I'll let and you." And then get he's it. like, "No, no, 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 no," when he storyboarded, and she was like, "Oh." Yeah, that was also interesting in the interview. We learned that you know, it's like I always feel bad. You know, when we talk about animes or mangas, right? Because in manga, always like a one or two people get all the credits when I know there were a ton of assistants aren't getting any credit. Yep. And in anime and movies, this on TV shows, there's a ton of fucking people working on those things. And we always just talk about like the one person, right? Yeah. But they, she said in the post credit interview that like, yeah, Yuasa draws 100% of the storyboards themselves. Which uh, I think Satoshi Kon was also that way. Right. And it's like, Oh, okay. I guess I can pretty much give you the credit for this whole fucking thing, yeah, yeah. right? As you know, obviously you you're not fully responsible for every aspect of it, but in terms of you know the the overwhelming majority of the creative input was at your direction and from your mind. You are the primary author of this work by far. But uh, so I will give you most of the credit. For that, right? But going further, and not uh, feel too bad. But I, f- I felt this before. But now that we've done, now that the track record is basically batting a thousand, Science Saru is a really important I force still, in anime. Oh yeah, I still wonder if they're overworking their people, but <laughs> more so, you know, in in the bad anime industry way. But uh, on Young made a really they interesting. They have point. like less than a hundred people. They founded the studio basically to make that Adventure Time episode, mm-hmm. and then they made everything. Mm-hmm. But but all the things they made, the they're rare in that they make both feature films and television. Yep. And she talked about how that's how they can have a development pipeline to give up and coming people in the animation industry the ability to like try directing and try like like someone yeah, can like uh, be the episode director for something and not like risk ruining a movie. Yeah, when you look at other anime studios, uh, the vast majority of them seem to either be in the TV business yep. or the movie business and sometimes video game cutscenes. But by business, having both, right? they're getting right. what the anime industry started to lose in Japan. If you look at all the greats we talk about and you look at like the works over their lives, they guess, all started as like key animation for episode four of like Gundam. Right. But it's like, you know, it's, I guess Madhouse made movies and TV shows. Yeah. Right. But it's like Ghibli only makes movies. Is there a Ghibli TV show? I haven't seen one. But, but she specifically pointed out that they do it because it lets them have the freedom to have their own internal development pipeline. Right. It's like you're some new person or you're, you're lower in the totem pole. We're not going to let you make a movie. Right. The movies are serious biz. But. You can have a lot more creative input on the TV shows, right? I don't think, you know, Yuasa is hand-drawing every storyboard for every TV episode. Yeah, I'll I'll trust someone else to draw a storyboard, maybe. So other people can express their ideas, you know, something like a Tatami Galaxy or the new show that I watched one episode of that I'm going to watch Keep your hands off Azokin. Yeah, keep your hands off Azokin is their new show, right? And it's like... There's a lot of opportunity for other creators in the studio to have a lot of creative input on those TV shows and prove that they're good enough and maybe then work on a movie later if they're, you know, they stand out. But still, they said there's less than 100 people working there making all this stuff. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, that doesn't sound like a... So they got another film coming called Inuo. It's supposed to premiere in 2021. It doesn't even have a Wikipedia page yet. Okay. So maybe they're taking a little break now. Is there any movie they made after uh, Ride Your Wave? Not no? according okay. to Wikipedia. Okay. Uh, and yeah. TV shows, they're making a ton, right? Yep. Uh, so there you go. Science Saru, like, just keep an eye on that. If you see Science Saru make anything, you should pretty much go see it. I haven't seen a bad thing that they've made. I feel like if we were younger and still, like, boisterous, like, kids going to anime cons, we'd be doing that sophist dance around a con at least once. Oh, the sophist dance replacing the Naruto walk? Yep. <laughs> the Naruto run, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I gotta watch that again. I only yeah. saw that one time. So go see this movie. <laughs> 
This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows...